good morning to all of you the topic of fraud and corruption i think has become of great relevance in developing countries both with respect to domestic arbitrations and international arbitrations and also investment treaty arbitrations and why it's become relevant i'll mention it towards the end i'll first give you all just an outline of how the law stands as on today in india in so far as the arbitration act is concerned there is no provision with respect to arbitrability of disputes where allegations of fraud have been made the two stages at which an objection can be raised with respect to fraud and corruption one is at the pre reference stage that is when parties go to the court under section 11 ask for appointment of an arbitrator it's at that stage at the pre reference stage under section 11 that the court will decide whether there is a prima facie case made out of fraud and or whether it can be referred to arbitration and resolved through arbitration the second stage is at the stage of setting aside an award that the award has been procured by fraud or corruption and consequently enforcement of this award under section 36 now these provisions are contained basically in part 1 of the act which is applicable to local arbitrations and it is also applicable to india seated international arbitration so that is where the law stands now under section 11 on the issue of arbitrability of fraud the earlier view was till 2010 that allegations of fraud cannot be arbitrated upon because they require a lot of evidence to be dealt with these are issues which affect the reputation of a person they come into the public policy domain and it should be done in a public hearing by a court of law rather than through a private adjudication by a private person so this stage continued to hold the fort right up to 2016 when the first judgment came out that was ayya swami which says if there are serious allegations of fraud like forgery etc then they are not arbitrable they have to be decided by a court of law but if they are mere allegations of fraud which are made loosely that can certainly be arbitrated upon so that was the beginning of the change it was a landmark decision where they dealt with it and thereafter came a spate of cases followed by rashid raza and uh, where rashid raza said that the, there are two issues which have to be determined one is whether the plea of fraud vitiates the arbitration agreement irrespective of the allegations of fraud with respect to the commercial contract because if it uh, if fraud is the allegation with respect to the commercial contract it can be adjudicated by a private arbitration tribunal however if it vitiates the arbitration agreement itself then it cannot be arbitrated upon for instance i'll give you all to make it simpler i will give you an example of how it can vitiate the arbitration agreement that cannot be arbitrated upon because the agreement itself to arbitrate is in doubt an example is that one of the parties during the, which and i am telling you from uh, true facts they had entered into certain commercial contracts between two builders matter went to the court and while the interim application was being argued they came out with an agreement on some stamp paper which contained an arbitration clause and they said no no we can't you know have it adjudicated by the civil court you have to refer us to an arbitrator and they gave a named uh, you know there was a named arbitrator in that agreement the other party turned around this is the fag end of the proceedings they have come out with this objection and they said it's and they took the uh, they made the allegation that the contract to arbitrate has been fraudulently procured and they said we have not signed any such agreement we are not willing to submit ourselves to arbitration matter went to court and court resolved it but that's not the issue this is an instance where the arbitration agreement is vitiated by fraud 
then the adjudication has to take place by the, a court of law and not by an arbitrator because the agreement itself is in doubt. However, if allegations of fraud are made with respect to the underlying contract and not the arbitration agreement, those can certainly be adjudicated by a private tribunal and that is where the law stands today. After Rashid Raza came Avitel and uh, then uh, there's Vidya Drolia and the last judgment I think which was delivered was by me in Indian Global Mercantile where I said that every civil dispute and commercial dispute which can be adjudicated by a court of law can be adjudicated in arbitration and these fine distinctions should not be made because the uh, position in law has become obsolete when they said allegations of fraud cannot be arbitrated. That is no longer good law. Now setting aside, uh, the setting aside stage is a stage when the award is passed and the other party goes to the court and says that under section 34 2b <coughs> that this award has been procured by fraud or by corruption and therefore you cannot enforce it under us under section 36. And 36 was amended in 2021 where they incorporated an explanation to section 36 subsection 3 and they said where such an allegation is made, the court is satisfied that a prima facie case has been made out, it would not be enforceable till the matter is decided. So that is where the law stands today and corruption of course internationally is considered to be that if an award is procured through corruption, you cannot enforce it. And I'll just give you all one or two examples on this. One example is, this is from a reported judgment uh, passed by the Delhi High Court where there was a three member tribunal. An award was passed, the other side which had lost went to the court and they said this is an award which has been procured by fraud and corruption because one of the arbitrators has never attended the proceedings which are mentioned in the award and uh, even the party said we had never got notice of this. They have forged and fabricated the minute books and therefore it is not enforceable at all. The court went to, through the entire record and set it aside on the ground of fraud and corruption and held it to be an unenforceable award. So that very, very briefly in uh, you know a nutshell is how the law stands today. Now uh, with respect to the further discussion, I leave it to my co-panelists and we will come back on each of the issues as they arise. Just wanted to give you all that today fraud is certainly arbitrable except in cases of forgery, impersonation, etc. There, of course, the courts do not refer it to arbitration in India and in so far as criminal uh, cases are concerned, they are obviously outside the purview of arbitration because they lie in the domain of public law. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Thomas, I think, uh, you know, you've got extensive experience in dealing with uh, commercial arbitration. Um, so, uh, we'd love to know your views on that too, please. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. So, to, to explain how I come at this from a different perspective, I'm a commercial arbitration lawyer based in Singapore, so I do SIAC or HKAC arbitrations. And I see this issue of corruption or fraud coming up quite often in my cases. I, I think fraud cases are, are good fun when you're on the claimant side and you're trying to prove a fraud. Um, and they're also very interesting on, on the defendant side. And I suppose my my experience helps me understand why the Indian courts have grappled with the question of the arbitrability of fraud. Because I think the reality is it's very hard to establish fraud in an arbitration because of some of the features of arbitration. And I see that in my arbitration practice, and I think that's part of what has motivated some concern on the part of the courts um, as to arbitrability. Um, now, I'm going to focus on this um, from the perspective of thinking about, well, maybe there are ways of amending or refining the arbitral process to um, resolve those concerns rather than addressing it from the arbitrability question and sending it to court. But, uh, but I can see that there are difficult questions about where to draw the line. And, and really, from, from my perspective, there are three 
issues that make it hard to establish fraud in an arbitration. And these are issues that mean if I was a, a fraudster, I'd probably rather be in arbitration than in court, um, to be honest. Uh, the first issue is the, is the approach to document production. And in just in very broad terms, courts tend to order much wider document production than arbitral tribunals. So uh, rules around what document production is customary in arbitration. Uh, and they require you to be very specific about what you're looking for, is the gist of it, in arbitration. Um, and this is a problem because normally when you're trying to prove fraud or corruption, um, you need to rely on something that the other party has done. And often because for fraud, we know the key issue is the state of mind of the person um, who, who was speaking or making the, the representation. Um, often the only way of proving their state of mind is by looking at their own documents. You know, it's looking at the discussions they were having with their colleagues at the time. It's by understanding the inside story um, of your counterparty and so the motive um, for misleading. Uh, and also their internal view about what the truth was as compared to what they were saying to you. And the problem is it's very hard to be specific about what you need to ask for to prove that because often you don't quite know where it's going to come up. You know, you don't know where, where that document that's going to show this mismatch, mismatch between the internal view and the external view will be. Um, and that's particularly the case because the, the alleged fraudster, the person you're making the accusation against, has this opportunity to misdirect you or bamboozle you in the way that they present their own case. And so you essentially end up getting misdirected. And that's happened to me where you see witnesses you've accused of fraud say things that you, you have to take at face value that go to, for example, sort of the scope of their involvement. And so you premise these specific requests on that. Um, but then it becomes clear through the process that actually their involvement was much wider. And so you should have been looking over here when they got you to look, look over there. So this is a really big practical problem. Now, my advice when advising um, claimants in those kind of cases is that really to get ahead in this kind of case, you've got to find routes outside the arbitral process to get access to documents. And so often where there's a successful fraud claimant it is because, for example, there have been some satellite litigation where they've had, where you've been able to access relevant documents there. Um, I don't mean litigation in breach of the arbitration agreement, but perhaps a related claim, um, perhaps a, an insolvency or a, um, some kind of um, professional put in to run a business, and so you've had access to documents and been able to audit it. Um, or the way, another way I've seen it is where you're relating to a fraud on a, perhaps related to a joint venture, for example. Um, it may be that you have a contractual right to documents from your joint venture, which again lets you sort of peer under the hood and, and see what's going on in there. So there, there are ways of addressing this really fundamental point, um, but sometimes you, you can't address it. I mean, the, the arbitral process is just not set up in the same way, and I don't think any arbitration tribunal is going to give you the broadest disclosure that a court might give you in the right circumstances. Um, and I've seen this specific issue be litigated or, or arbitrated, I should say, where the allegation is that it's just not possible to have a fair hearing anymore because of the control that the alleged fraudster has over the flow of information and over the disclosure <laughs> process. Um, and that gives rise to very difficult um, questions. And it's also being litigated, I know, in the English courts at the moment where um, the, uh, that, that's a fraud by a government, so it's a corruption fraud crossover case. Um, and there's an issue about whether you can even have a fair trial in circumstances where the government is controlling the disclosure process. So um, I, I know this sounds like a bit of an esoteric issue, this sort of access to documents, but really in, in practice it makes all, all the difference. Uh, my two other points are, are much shorter, um, and, and they're more a matter of impression rather than something I have a lot of evidence on. Um, but my next point is, my sense is that witnesses are more willing to lie in arbitration than they are in court. Um, I'll never be able to get empirical evidence on that. Um, but it is my sense that the, uh, the sense of formality and the publicity of giving evidence in court um, and also the repercussions of lying to a court do um, have an effect on witnesses um, and encourage them to be more truthful in their approach. Now, it doesn't always work. Witnesses lie to court all the time. Um, but I do have this suspicion that um, witnesses may be more willing to um, play fast and loose with an arbitral tribunal in a private process. Um, and secondly, and unfortunately, I feel that's also the case for counsel. Um, not all counsel, but, I, uh, but I, I feel I've seen examples where we've had behavior from counsel on the other side um, in their conduct of the proceedings, where my suspicion is if this was a court process, 
um, and they were standing both in public and in front of the bench, you know, a bench that would be willing to um, really sort of slap them down if they stepped out of line. We sometimes just don't don't get the same sort of standard of conduct that um, we should expect. Um, and, and that matters when, to, for example, going back to the document production issues and the access to information, you really have to rely on counsel for an accused fraudster acting in a, a proper and responsible way. Um, and so those are just some impressions sort of based on, based on cases that I've dealt with. And so um, I think they, they can be overcome, or you can at least be aware of them when you're representing a claimant. Um, but, um, but those are things that weigh on my mind. Thank you, Thomas. Please. Insofar as uh, proceedings before an arbitrator is concerned are distinct from those in a court of law because the standard of proof which is applicable is entirely different. In so far as civil proceedings are concerned, it's preponderance of probabilities, while in a court of law where you make allegations which have criminal overtones, the standard is proof beyond reasonable doubt. So that is also a big distinction between the uh, proceedings which are conducted in a private arbitral tribunal while compared with a court of law. Kabir, if I can turn to you, um, I know you've got uh, a special presentation and, uh, you know, given, given the topic at hand and given there are cases, arbitration cases involving corruption, uh, we like to see it as developing countries in India, but that's not true. It happens globally. Um, and I think you've got uh, some examples for us, uh, yeah. for the audience, so uh, appreciate if you could. Sure, just delighted to be here. I'm going to start off with two sociological observations. The first, it's a Sunday morning. The room is filled. There's a peanut gallery back there. Well done. This, I think, happens only in India where you can get a room filled on a Sunday morning. Uh, well done. We can't do this in New York. And the second point, corruption is a bad thing. Can we agree on this? Right, we're told 2.6 trillion bucks is lost every year in corruption. That is money none of us can imagine. There's zeros that, how many zeros? A lot. A lot. <laughs> right? You can see the World Bank, right? It robs schools and it rots institutions. And that's just nice to have alliteration in observations. But that's where we are when it comes to corruption, right? It's a serious matter. Now, how does corruption work in investment arbitration? Now, it works both as a sword, you can use it offensively, and as a shield, defensively. And it's pretty amazing because you can raise... At, so the judge spoke about the front-end and back-end challenges of corruption before courts. In an arbitration, in investment arbitration, you can raise it four times in an arbitration. As a jurisdictional challenge, throw the case out. As an admissibility challenge, you can hear the case, but don't. It's corrupt. On the merits, you can use corruption as a basis to reject allegations being made. And finally, if all of these are rejected, you can use it as a basis to reduce the money to be paid. Contributory fault. Right? You can see why people like raising allegations of corruption. Right? Your chances of suddenly implicated have increased four times. Right? Something both the speakers have mentioned. It is sexy to raise these. You know, we often joke, if you haven't put an allegation of corruption in a big case, you're probably committing malpractice as counsel. Okay, now, just in and out, the general standard, and we've heard the judge talk about this, 51%. I say something, Vinita says something, balance of probability, whose story is better? Always Vinita just so we're clear. <laughs> Ajay agrees, right? Civil lawyers would describe this as the inner conviction test. Same idea. Now, for fraud, corruption, the kind of distinction that we're seeing in India doesn't seem to exist internationally. These are all bad things, and we're going to treat them all equally. 
we're told the standard is heightened. Now, it isn't heightened to the criminal standard that the courts seem to be applying, but it is slightly heightened. Think about this as 70%, just if it helps in your mind. Very important. You are often not going to find proof. And so tribunals can use red flags. They can look at fishy circumstances and make findings of corruption. Judges are likely going to be much more willing to do this than arbitrators. Now, I'll just very quickly look at two cases. We'll get in and out of these relatively quickly. I said you often don't have proof of corruption or you don't have real evidence. This case is an outlier. Now, this case involves a, ah, this is when animation suck. The business here is duty-free shops in airports. And the investor says, I'm under investigation because I'm not supporting the president of Kenya. This is the allegation being made. Okay? Kenya comes forward saying, the contract, now this is a contractual dispute, is null and void because two million was paid as a bribe. And the investor actually says, this is traditional practice. In India, we say chai pani. In Africa, they say harambi. Right? Uh, somebody told me this is fundraising. <laughs> you take the euphemisms for what they are worth. The claimant, Mr. Ali, is called for cross-examination. And the award actually, arbitral awards are boring, like most court proceedings. Read this. This is a good one. The award actually says that in cross-examination, he's asked, did you pay a bribe? And he says, yes. And he tells how the bribe was paid, which is hilarious. He took a bag, something like this, filled it with money, left it outside the president's office. The meeting ends. He comes back. The bag is there. He opens the bag, and the money has been replaced with coal. Butta, the world's most expensive court. Now, the applicable law was Kenyan law, so obviously the tribunal applied English law and said fraud is bad and threw the case out. Now, this case is really extreme. Just to give you an example, you're often not going to have a person, Thomas, people lie, <laughs> right? You're not going to have, and this case probably sets a bad precedent now telling us don't tell <laughs> the truth. Let's just look at another case, Metal Tech versus Uzbekistan. I've actually just come from Uzbekistan. If you want to visit a really beautiful country, do visit the country. People think of Uzbekistan and Afghanistan in the same breath. They're not the same. Google it afterwards. Uh, here we have, again, the investor raising allegations that they're being attacked by the state. The state comes forward. Now, it's a very interesting argument because the country is often relying on corruption that it has committed as a basis to throw the case out. Make of that what you will. Here they made $500,000 investment and they have paid $3.5 to consultants. Who are the consultants? Friends and family of the president. If you don't know anything about the Stans, they all became independent in 1991, and they all have had democratically elected presidents for life. Wink, wink. OK? So 3.5 million consultants, 500,000 is your capital contribution. And the allegation by the state is this 3.5 million is a bribe. OK, and that's the question. Are these? Are these genuine business people or are these just pretexts to get the contract from this state? Make of this what you will, but the tribunal allows the investor 12 times, you have 12 procedural orders to prove what these consultants were doing. They, the claimant kept saying, no, it's genuine, but they couldn't prove what they were doing. And so the tribunal here uses a red flag 
Remember, you're making a finding on the absence of evidence to conclude that the money paid was a bribe and the case gets thrown out. Now, we started off saying corruption is invoked in a lot of cases. There are about three slash four, based on how you count things, cases that have actually made a finding on corruption. So corruption is still as an evidentiary issue, not the norm. With that, this is funny, and I'm going to stop. Thank you. Vanita, any comments on that? Uh, yeah, so uh, he's right on that uh, local custom, if we touch upon, the, yeah. these two cases are an outliers. You know, to, it's difficult because uh, in the World Duty Free Kenya case also, what he said was that I thought it was a personal donation. The Harambe is like, there's a custom that people pool in resources, the community, and they pool in resor resources for the community's development. Uh, but, and similarly, in uh, India as well, we have a custom of paying gifts on Diwali or for felicitation of public servants. There are two cases we came across where even giving gifts on Diwali, it ha there has to be an element of quid pro quo. So yes, it's difficult to prove, but this is the circumstantial evidence that you will see. Because in the World Duty Free case, it's on the very same day where the briefcase was left. That is the day when the agreement was finalized, you know, for the World Duty Free, the, uh, the, which was the subject matter of the arbitration. So quid pro quo, the circumstantial evidence, uh, there has to be a standard of proof which is a little higher than the prime FSI case, because after all, it's a very serious allegation which is like a gateway issue you somebody wants to avoid arbitration and we are all seeing there's a pro arbitration approach so the standard of proof has to be a little higher than a prime fsi case and a little lower than the conclusive evidence uh, approach which is for criminal proceedings so we have in our indian uh, system there's a parallel and disciplinary inquiries which happen uh, for employees of the government where a, an employee might be charged of corruption. In criminal proceedings, it, it is a different ball game. But when there are disciplinary proceedings, the standard is lower. So to that extent, uh, even an arbitration, it's not a trial of the corruption action per se. It's only a trial to know if the contract is void or not. So the standard of proof need not be really heightened because and the, in Indian law, there are cases in Supreme Court which say that findings in arbitration proceedings will not be binding on criminal proceedings. So the uh, consequence is not that, you know, if you are found guilty of corruption in an arbitration proceedings, if another party chooses to take somebody, uh, file, to, chooses to file a criminal complaint, it will be dealt with in its own uh, manner. And uh, even the metal tech case, uh, which, uh, so in one case, again on circumstantial evidence, uh, they said that the payment made as a consultant, those people were not even qualified. Like he said, they were relatives of the prime minister. But with respect to another charge, they threw away. They said this payment is not as a bribe because there was nothing to show that that, that person was a consultant and there was no circumstantial evidence as such. So. Mostly, uh, 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 the courts have relied upon uh, uh, circumstantial evidence like whether or not the process of awarding the contract was followed, whether the people who uh, have signed the contract are authorized or not. Uh, it's an old case, 2005 case uh, in India, where the enforcement of where the award was set aside at the stage of appeal, uh, only on this fact that uh, 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 on the basis that there is sufficient evidence, right from Russell versus Russell, which is the first case which said that allegations, mere allegations of corruption will not throw out arbitration. They said a sufficient amount of evidence, those were the words used. So, yeah. Thank you for that. In my view, in so far as investment treaty arbitrations are concerned, I think they stand on a completely different level. For the reason that it is the state, is the, for instance, if there is an award passed, it's against the Republic of India, and it impacts the citizens of the country. So, for instance, there is a case which is, you know, which came to the courts, where the allegation was that the officers of the PSU had taken bribes and changed 
the entire economics of the case and it came to light when the enforcement of the award uh, when it came to the courts for enforcement of the award and by the time the officials who had entered into the contract soon after their retirement were absorbed by the company which had invested into india so there is obviously it's very difficult to produce evidence in these cases the huge amounts which are awarded they impact the developing countries and take away resources which should have been spent on the development of the country to paying foreign investors where there has been a lot of uh, you know things which are not about board for instance there is a matter which is going on which i read about it in the law reports it's it's a reported judgment that midway the contract was uh, amended and the amounts were upped which was abnormal it was at a time when the the economy had taken a, a, you know it was at the lowest ebb and suddenly the prices were upped in the agreement so one the part it, the matter reached the courts and they found that you know there were certain observations made by the tribunal saying it's a little abnormal for the prices to be up x number of times over these matters come to the court to find the evidence is difficult but at the end of the day there are very serious allegations and very frequently it's the top investigative agencies which take over the matter so in these cases i don't think we can really treat investment treaty arbitrations at par because the impact is far more uh, you know far reaching to the citizens is the taxpayer who will have to bear the loss and the huge amounts awarded and costs awarded and tribunals are not in a position really to adjudicate and i think in these cases they need to be adjudicated in a court of law rather than a private tribunal which is doing it in closed doors there has to be far greater transparency and where these serious allegations of fraud are made look at the amounts which a, a developing country has to churn up to meet these awards otherwise they get a bad name oh see so and so country is not enforcing foreign awards but what goes on you know in the making of such awards is is a matter of concern so uh, just to give one more sort of perspective on it you know uh, when we look at uh, issues relating to red flags right um we mentioned the indian new year and there's the chinese new year there's all these occasions where vendors and other parties and business uh, associates are giving each other something on uh, under the banner of that new year celebration as a thank you or whatever and i know over the years i've seen with the fcpa there's been very strict regulation and and american companies working in india have had stress points where they're like what do you mean we're not allowed to get a box of sweets at diwali and stuff like that and then uh, you know legal counsel has made policies saying okay you can do something up to 10 us dollars Yeah, and the, and then there's other disclosure norms right so it's all about disclosure about conflict uh, and and are these sort of issues prevalent or not so the reason i'm pointing that out is the chinese new year indian new year is a local custom issue right uh, and then we're talking about international arbitration here where you have uh, the international laws you got the laws uh, that that Uh, impact uh, fraud and corruption laws of that jurisdiction or that country or the clauses in that uh, uh, in the contract right thomas so so then there are issues that come up with what is the local customs and practice and what's allowed here so thomas any thoughts on specifically on that and i'd like vanita also to to chat about uh, where the local customs kind of override things. yeah look i think this is a really difficult question you know how do you balance this sort of high standard of conduct that we expect of senior employees of of um companies or public officials um with customs that we we are all familiar with but there's sort of a couple of overarching themes that I think about on this topic in the first is and and um justice has already mentioned it corruption really harms developing economies so when we're talking about or or all economies corruption and fraud they harm economies they harm businesses um they mean that things are done for the wrong reasons and we have individuals who are benefiting um at the expense of their country or at the expense of their um business and and the shareholders of that business um and so this isn't a sort of a 
an external international standard versus what's okay in the country. This is about trying to regulate conduct. And actually, bribery and corruption is also a crime in most developing countries. I mean, there might be a question about whether that is enforced or not, but ultimately it probably is a crime. Um, and actually, some of, when I look at my clients and just sort of their own gifts and entertainments policy and our ability even to spend time with our own clients, I find our um, developing country clients are actually the hardest to spend time with because they have such strict rules around what they're allowed to accept in terms of taking them out for socializing or, or, or a lunch or something. Um, so, so that's my sort of starting point. I don't think this is sort of an international versus a developing country battle. This is a problem that developing countries and all countries have, and we need to find a way of drawing a line. Um, but I also want to illustrate both how I think the line can be hard to draw, um, but also I think it's, some of you may be familiar with this sort of line about where's the line between art and pornography, and the US court said, well, I know it when I see it. <laughs> and, and to me, it's a bit like that with corruption. It's a bit hard to come up with a new principle to help you tell the difference, but I think you do know it when you see it. But I want to explain how this has actually played out, for example, in, in China. Um, so China has a, also has a lot of customs around it being important to socialize with the people that you are doing business with. Very strong culture of um, giving gifts as a way of showing respect. Um, and so that's the, the starting point. But there reaches a point where something unacceptable is happening. And, and two examples of that. So eating together, we all understand the importance of eating, eating together. But particularly in the sort of Chinese market, and so you also see it in Hong Kong and Singapore, there's this whole sort of sub-industry now of absolutely excessively lavish entertainment, um, you know, dishes that I, I can't even think that anybody even enjoys, <laughs> but are, are considered such a delicacy because they are known to be expensive, I think, in reality. Um, I don't know whether any, any of you have had um, shark fin soup. I haven't, but what I'm told is it, it's a very sort of bland dish that essentially tastes like cartilage, but it's a, it's a very... Um, uh, prestigious dish it costs hundreds of dollars a plate and it will be included and you see it in the fancy restaurants they've got sort of the the menu for normal people and then you've got the menu that I always think that's the bribe menu <laughs> because <laughs> it's got items on there that are just so expensive that you can't imagine anyone um, really thinks that that's it's worth spending that money um, and so that that's a time when I feel like you can tell somebody's crossing the line um, another example is it would be I don't know if the, any of you know what a Mai Tai or Mutu is but it's essentially sort of Chinese rice brandy so again, this, this would be a nice gift to give in a sensible way to somebody that you were very close to and who would enjoy the drink. You might give them a bottle of this brandy. Um, but in China, this whole market grew up where there were sort of these different brands of, of, of Mai Tai. And essentially, you could sort of take them down to the shop and swap them for cash. <laughs> and it was, this is, this is sort of the, 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 you know, the $20,000 Mai Tai, and this is the $50,000 Mai Tai. And it's not, it's not because it was some fine burgundy wine from... France, of which there's only a few bottles, it was just a barter system, and it, it sort of became a way of pretending that you were observing a custom, and, and they would say they were observing a custom, they were gifting, you know, a bottle of brandy, but ultimately that's not really what was going on. Uh, and I, I do think in most of these cases you can just tell the difference, provided you have the information. I mean, and, and that is still always the problem, that it's the fraudster, it's the corrupt party who tends to control the access to, to information that you would need to tell the real story um, about what's going on. Anita, your thoughts on Yeah. So just wanted to add, uh, so as far as, uh, you know, even for dealing with cases of corruption, the applicable law of the host country and, uh, you know, uh, the claimant will be seen. And there is not much conflict between the international policy, like what uh, ma'am has also said and what Tom asked, that corruption is per se bad and it pr pervades, I mean, it affects the entire public. So even in cases where local customs is of uh, is uh, giving gifts like we talked about harambi and we talked about the diwali custom and the chinese custom it all comes down to quid pro quo whether you can relate it to any undue benefit flowing to the person who has given the gift and uh, even in kenya the, uh, there was a task force in Ke uh, of the kenyan government which itself said that harambi is being misused so there is not really a conflict i mean an international policy will anyway prevail and because in many of the countries corruption is a criminal offense prevention of corruption act has been uh, you know enacted in many countries so as such local custom cannot really be a come to any person's defense if they t take it in that manner and yes circumstances like i have always said that you have to 
match the dots, the connecting the dots, which uh, Kabir also said. Yeah. Kabir, anything more to add to that? Uh, uh, no, I mean, I, at this stage, I agree with everything. You know, just easiest to say that. I just will, after saying that, I will add something. <laughs> It is really hard at the end of the day to make an inference that there is corruption. Because that is a finding on a negative. There is no evidence. You are making a conclusion looking at circumstances. And arbitrators are inherently reluctant to make that finding unless you can really show circumstantial evidence leading to this singular conclusion. I just put this out there. The Something like, well, it could be a little short of that, but, but, you know, the fact that everybody understands these are bribes are often not going to meet the standard of proof in the mind of a tribunal. You're going to have to show something much more explicitly. So if you are a purist who wants to see corruption rooted out, arbitration is likely going to disappoint you. The, these are not courts. They just don't have the power. They often look at their mandate not to solve mera problems of corruption, but to resolve purely commercial disputes. I just put that for whatever it is worth out there. They are not investigative agencies. Sorry. In fact, it's not only the arbitral tribunals, but sometimes courts of law also find it very difficult to get the evidence of corruption it's actually connecting the dots, as Vanita said correctly, because you s suddenly, if a contract is up five times over, it, there's obviously something remiss. And in fa the case which I just mentioned a little while ago, the tribunal found that there was something very extraordinary for the price to be up to when the market had fallen so low. So you have to connect the dots. You really cannot prove beyond reasonable doubt. And very often the convictions are low. So that is in fact the argument which is used that you guys were not even able to convict them. So how are you talking about corruption? So this is a very problematic area. Maybe, can I just add something in, in two minutes, and, and Kabir might comment on this. I mean, we focused on developing countries, we're in India, and we've talked about India. Look, England and the US have massive corruption problems. You know, we might not frame it in quite the same way, but there's been a huge amount written, I mean, in the US context about the influence of money in politics, the way the political system is structured to allow, you know, billionaires to spend huge amounts of money in, in a way that provides collateral benefits to um, politicians. And in the UK, there's been a huge amount of reporting over the last few years on the impact of particularly Russian money in London and the impact that having these excessively wealthy people who came in and bought football clubs and newspapers and had lavish parties. Um, and, and if you're interested, sort of Google about Boris Johnson and his, his links with some very famous Russians because um, he, was, he was, you know, spending his social time with people who used to be in the KGB. Um, and they'd become very rich and they were very attractive um, on the London scene. They call it sort of reputation washing. You know, you come to London and buy a football club uh, and, you, and you become um, reputable. And so it's, you know, we, we started off from a particular context, but all democracies, all states are really trying to grapple with this problem of how do you make sure that um, your officials and, and, and your businesses are being run in a way where decisions are made for the right reasons. And so it's something we're all going to have to keep, keep working on, I think. Uh, thank you so much. And, um, you know, Vanita, if I could just shift to asking you a bit about shifting the burden of proof um, in corruption cases, because at times it can be controversial. So I'd love to know your thoughts for the audience, please. Okay, sure. So, uh, like we said, that even though uh, because it's a gateway issue where we can somebody can avoid arbitration, the, the degree of proof has to be a little heightened and prima facie case. And once that is crossed, only then should the burden of proof be shifted. Because it should not be a mere al bald allegation and then you, you know, shift the burden and the arbitrator asks the other side to explain. It has to be a little more than that. You have to show some circumstances. For example, in one case, uh, which, was, which arose, like I said, uh, at the time of filing a Section 34 appeal against uh, an award, 
At that time, they saw these circumstances. It was a railway contract. Uh, it had, uh, there was a process involved in awarding government contracts. That process was not followed. These were the allegations which were made. There were certain officers who were authorized to sign the contract, but the actual officers were different. So at that point, the court shifted the burden. And then there was an enhancement of the contract, which also had certain processes which were not followed. So these were circumstances which prevailed upon the court to shift the burden to the respondents who could not discharge that. And therefore, the award was set aside because, uh, 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 because they saw that prime FSI, there appears to be corruption. So we, we need to have a certain degree of certainty, and there, that's where red flags come in. Of course, that's a starting point, and we need to have indicators which can continue being evolved. So the starting point as a red flag indicator is whether the process was followed or not, especially in gov where governments are involved. There are always these guidelines. The, they'll have internal rules uh, there's, uh, on how to uh, award contracts. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is a very agreeable panel. <laughs> I actually agree. No, <laughs> we planned that. I'm yeah. kidding. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I agree. <laughs> there will be no direct evidence for corruption. That is something we must acknowledge. So if you're raising an allegation of corruption, it's not shifting in the sense I say there's corruption, now it's to Vanita to prove there isn't corruption. That's ridiculous. Assuming that there is no corruption, we are asking her to prove a negative. But I do think if I can make a prima facie showing, and I think that would be the standard, then it becomes, I don't think technically we would say burden of proof. I would think we would say the burden of persuasion shifts to Vanita to rebut my prima facie case. So I think that's how the shuttle of evidence would operate and take place. Uh, just recognizing it's easy to make these allegations. It's often very difficult, even with red flags, even with circumstantial evidence, even with techniques like connecting the dots to actually find corruption. I would just add to that. I mean, I think as well you can think of when we're talking about drawing inferences from gaps, we, we're normally talking about something quite specific, and the, and the metal tech example is a really good one. If you want to say to a court, you should draw an inference that this was a, a corrupt payment based on the circumstances, let's sort of play out how this works. So you say, well, there are a lot of high-value contracts that were being entered into at the same time as the main contract, these consultancy agreements for a lot of money. And these contracts were being entered into with um, associates of the president of the state. So we're starting to get into sort of red flags and we're starting to raise questions. And this is probably the bit at which the, the burden of persuasion starts to shift. And then it becomes obvious, well, if there was a good reason for the, these million dollar consultancy agreements, you know, let's see what work was done. <laughs> you know, where are the slide decks where they explain what they were doing or wh where's the report that they issued um, explaining what, what work product was being produced and so on. And that's why I think the Metal Tech Tribunal gave the, um, the, the, the party who now was facing the burden of persuasion these 12 opportunities to you know, show us the work product, show us the reason for having these side contracts. And when they keep failing to do so when it should be very easy to do so, that's a great example of, of how you shift the burden of proof or, or, or really I think we'd ask the court to, um, it's not shifting the burden, it's asking the court to draw an evidential inference that there's an obvious piece of evidence that could be provided. And in the absence of providing it, you should assume in my favor that the reason it's not being provided is because there's no good answer and, and actually I'm right. Thank you. Indraji, any closing comments? Because we're out of time and I just wanted to see if the team had any questions. Please. I've given actually my comments well on each of the topics. <laughs> I, I, I'll just, you know, to connect what Thomas had said earlier with what Thomas just said. Uh, if Metal Tech was, the respondent was the United States, Lobbying is legal. Yeah. And if you would have come forth and said, we had paid these consultants to lobby for the government, that would be OK. Now, this is a very painful thing. The US has set a limit of $20 for government officials. So if I have to take anybody affiliated with the government, you have to fill out a painful form with receipts. 
with a limit of $20. Like coffee with a cake. Yeah, 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 exactly. But lobbying is okay for millions and billions of dollars. So there is this very weird reality in the West that somehow we are okay with. It probably doesn't, now we like to believe we're going to treat all the respondents the same. Clearly we don't. I don't think Uzbekistan got the benefit of the doubt, and probably it was the way the case was argued. The claimant kept saying, no, these are genuine consultants, and maybe that impacted how the case ultimately came out. But I just wanted to add that, that this is a global, weird reality. Got it. And thank you. Uh, any audience questions? Good one. Uh, thank you so much to the panel. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, my name is Anand Abhara. I'm a professor. But before that, I should say that I was counsel for a claimant in a very large BIT arbitration, which involved very large corruption allegations. <laughs> so I just want to play a little bit of devil's advocate over here, which is especially where a state or senior officials in the state are trying to extort an investor under standard rules of international state responsibility. It is the state's responsibility that that person, you know, you can think of world duty free. Yeah. You have to pay this money. Um, and then the state under international law is equally responsible for the corruption as the investor. Um, it, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a troubling yeah. outcome, but I was wondering whether you had thoughts about that, where yes, it does impact the, the people of the country, but it is in fact also the state itself. I wouldn't agree with you. I don't think you can hold the state responsible for acts of bribery, corruption by its officials. You can never do that because certainly no state can, uh, you know, take responsibility for it because there are uh, so many contracts where you find that the, you know, the officers have been corrupted at the stage of, in, even at the stage of the conditions being framed for bidding where they are changed around at the last minute to suit a particular investor who may have been blacklisted in his in various other countries. So there are very serious issues and I certainly don't think the states can be held responsible for the corruption of their officers who are taken for an expensive dinner, given a mink coat to you know try and bend the rules which comes to light much later. And the states and the populace living in those countries are made to pay the huge amounts. And the other issue which I would flag, although that's really not been, uh, you know, it's not a part of the panel discussion, is also on the constitution of the tribunals which adjudicate on these issues because there is, I think, a desperate requirement for diversity in the constitution of the tribunals to get a fair adjudication. That is an issue of the developing countries and I think it is a serious concern. Thank you. I'm Daniel Patan and I'm the student, second year student from Jindal Global Law School. I, my question is, like in court of law, if one of the party flouts the order, then that person becomes liable for contempt of court. So what about flouting the arbitral award? Because uh, arbitrators are private persons. Even an arbitral award is an enforceable decree under Indian law. So you can certainly move the court. There are provisions under Section 27 of the Arbitration Act. So you can move the court for enforcement, or even if there is contempt, you can you know deal with that. So now it's sort of like legally enforcing it. Yes, of course, of course. Otherwise, yeah. it'd be a paper paper award, which you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's the same elsewhere as well. It's the same in Singapore. What I would say is, although it's easy to focus on the non-compliant situation. Often when orders by tribunals are issued, they are complied with voluntarily, even by what seem like the most difficult counterparties or the most badly behaved counterparties, particularly if there's some kind of ongoing proceedings where you're going to have to go back in front of the same tribunal. Um, but yeah, certainly also in Singapore, both arbitral awards, but also orders of the tribunal on interlocutory matters are enforceable as if they were orders of the court. Um, so you can actually, in the end, get the same kind of remedies against the directors of the company or you know, follow exactly the same process. And this is the change which was made by the 2015 Amendment Act in India. When they, uh, you know, have made the powers of the tribunal under 17, they kept made it at par with Section 9. And for enforcement, you can go to a court of law by filing an application.